My name is Tammy Warden. I'm the Staff Development Coordinator for Alternative Services Incorporated. That just means that I do training and I mostly train direct care for the direct support professionals and that's you. Um, I've been doing this for a really long time. I've been an ASI for 27 years and I can tell you that doing this type of work as a direct care worker, as a manager, and now as a trainer, has really changed my life and hopefully helped me be a better person and make a bigger impact on everybody that I meet. So I hope you enjoy the class and I hope you enjoy working with us. Again, welcome to our team. All right, I'd first like to direct, introduce you to our executive director, Jenny Baskeran. Thanks, Tammy, and welcome everybody. Thank you for uh, joining the ASI team, as Tammy mentioned. Uh, we are a provider agency, as you know, that um, we, we work with people with a variety of needs. We work with people, primarily adults, some children, uh, but in a variety of settings and all over the state of Michigan. We have contracts with 13 agencies, 13 counties, and um, we've been doing this kind of work for 42 years. So we're a provider that's got a great reputation in the state of Michigan. We actually have a history of, which Tammy will talk about in your first training today, but we have a, a pretty strong history in the state of Michigan in being part of deinstitutionalization, helping people come out of state institutions and live more independently, which is 100% what um, the purpose of your, your role here at ASI will be. So we're pretty proud of that. And our, our um, experience over those 42 years has helped us to become uh, wise at understanding what people need and knowing that everything we do is about what the person needs. So we don't do a one size fits all kind of service. We meet people where they are. Tammy will be uh, really, honing in on that fact and that that being the basis of everything we do quite a bit in the trainings with you. But I just wanted to mention that I started out in direct care myself when I was uh, a wee one. Uh, I think I was 19 when I started in direct care and then kind of moved into more supervisory roles in a community mental health setting and then eventually came to ASI about nine and a half years ago as the executive director. And I love this company very, very much. Um, our mission is what we stand by and our mission is achieved because of and by people like you who um, bring their heart every day to the, the people that we serve. So thank you again for joining ASI, being part of our team. And with that, I will pass you to Stam Tammy Stevens who is our operations director. Tammy, take it away. Thanks, Jenny. I'm Tammy Hi. Stevens, the Operations Director for Alternative Services. I started at ASI in 1993, working in a group home midnights. Um, I did not know then how rewarding and fulfilling that this position would be and to make a difference in somebody's life, um, to assist them to be independent um, still gives me warm and fuzzies. When I started my training, it actually was a two week in classroom uh, training before you could even get onto the floor. So, you know, it's amazing the milestones that we've made and doing the training through video like this or PowerPoints. Uh, with that said, I just wanna welcome you to ASI. I hope you find your career here as rewarding as I have. And I will turn it over to Jackie now. Thank you, Tammy Stevens. I am Jackie Nell, the Administration Director at Alternative Services. And in my role, I work with Jenny and Tammy in recruitment. And I also work with our financial company to help make sure that we are paid every month by the residents who live in our homes. But what I am most passionate about in my position as the Administration Director is to helping to make sure that as an employee at ASI that you're getting the best, best uh, employee experience possible. So um, whether you're a seasonal employee or you're here for the long haul, we wanna hear how we're doing so far 
So we encourage you to visit the employee portal and on our website and click on the link for our suggestion box. Let us know um, if there's anything that we can do to give you a better experience. Click on our new employee survey and let us know how we're doing so far. Um, we're so happy you joined us. Thank you for becoming a part of our company. And I'll turn you back now to Tammy Warden, our trainer. Well, thank you, Jackie. Now, I appreciate that. Well, we're going to start our new class, your new class, not mine, Introduction to the Role of Residential Services. What does that mean? It means a lot of different things. It means what do we do as a provider corporation? How do we provide services? We're going to talk about our mission statement. We're going to talk about our core values in the acronym IMPACT. And I hope that you really enjoy this. I hope that I'm not too boring because you're going to hear my voice a lot. You won't always see me but you will hear my voice a lot. If you do notice some ticking on my part, I just wanna put it out there that I have Tourette's and I don't want you to be distracted by it. And if you wanna ask me questions about it, have at it. Now, now let's get started with the training and I hope you enjoy. Have a groovy day and welcome aboard. Hello everyone, my name is Tammy Warden I'm the Staff Development Coordinator for Alternative Services. I've been with Alternative Services now for 27 years. The first 10 years, I worked as a team coordinator. In the last 17 years, I've worked as a trainer. My primary job is to train all of the new direct support professionals, that's you, in the direct care curriculum that's required by the state of Michigan. So let's go ahead and get started with our first class that's called Introduction to Residential Services. The objectives for today is to identify and become familiar with ASI mission and core values, the roles of a direct support professional, philosophy of care standards, and the evolution of the CMH system. ASI's mission is supporting people to experience meaningful lives. Our core values are represented in the acronym IMPACT. I stands for integrity, M is for meaningful, P is for patience, A is for acceptance, C is for compassion, and T is for teamwork. So how could you demonstrate integrity at work? Well, you could demonstrate it through the accurate and thorough and honest documentation that you provide. So let's say Joe has a range of motion program in his plan of service. And the program indicates that Joe will do one session before dinner, and then he will do a second session before he goes to bed. So Joe seems to be in a really good mood. He's excited to talk to his housemates and staff about the wonderful day that he had. And so he's really eager and ready to do his range of motion for the first session. Now it's time for Joe to go to bed. And Joe says, you know what? I'm just really, really tired and I don't wanna do my range of motion tonight. Well, we would try to encourage Joe and remind him how important range of motion is we're not gonna scold or punish Joe if he doesn't wanna do it. What do we do? We document that we tried to encourage Joe, but ultimately he decided not to do it. That's fine. You're not gonna get in trouble for him not doing it. It's his right, it's his choice. What you do need to do though, is just to make sure that you document that we did offer it to him. The second core value is meaningful. Now, meaningful is different for each person. What's meaningful to me may not be meaningful to you. How do you know what's meaningful to someone? Well, you get to know them. You spend time with them. You communicate with them. Ask them what kinds of things they like, maybe what things they don't like. But definitely find out the things that they do like. So here's another example with Joe. So let's say Joe used to watch that Western show Gunsmoke. And he used to watch it with his grandpa when he was a young child. And he loved watching that show with his grandfather. So he still watches it on MeTV. And he wants you to sit down next to him and watch it with him because he thinks it's the greatest show in the world. And he wants to share that with you. So you sit down, you and Joe watch the show, and you kind of interact and talk when Joe wants to talk throughout it. 
Is that a big grandiose thing that you're doing with Joe? Well, to Joe it is. It may not be to you, but it is to Joe. See, meaningful activities don't have to be a big grandiose Harlem Globetrotter game or a Fleetwood Mac concert or something that most people would consider large and, and big. And although those are nice to do once in a while, that's not the only thing that makes something meaningful. It can be small, subtle interactions that are more meaningful to people sometimes than even the big ones. So get to know your person and find out what's meaningful to that person. The third core value is patience. Patience, patience. Patience means the ability to wait for a long time without becoming anxious, upset, annoyed, or angry. So we know that sometimes it takes a little bit longer when we're trying to involve people in their own lives. ASI is committed to involving people in their own lives. And that means that we want them to be as part of their own lives as much as you are part of your own life. And in order to do that sometimes, it may take them longer to complete a task or to do anything. So let's say that you're trying to get someone to the CMH appointment that's scheduled at five o'clock and you know that the client doesn't get out of work until 4.30. So you're gonna be really hustling and bustling to get there by five o'clock. Well, you know that if the client tries to get himself ready and get his shoes on and his coat on and it's winter time so he needs hats and gloves, it's gonna take him a long time. And so you're not gonna be there by five o'clock. So what do you do? Well, the first thing I would recommend is don't schedule it for five o'clock. What I would recommend is schedule it at a time where you can allow for that time. You can give the patience that's needed so that that person can do what he needs to do to get himself ready. So maybe schedule the CMH appointment at two o'clock. Maybe you can, if he goes to workshop, pick him up early and make a, make a little day of it or something. But be patient and allow that time for the person to do what he needs to do. Nobody wants to be rushed or hurried when they're trying to do something on their own. The next core value is acceptance. Now, this means meeting the person exactly where they're at. It doesn't mean, oh, I'm gonna be your friend and I'm gonna talk to you if you're good today. If you, if you go to workshop and you ride on the van without any incidents, when you get home tonight, you're going to get an ice cream cone. They don't have to earn an ice cream cone. They don't have to be good to get that ice cream cone. Now, there may be exceptions. If things are in the plans of service, you need to know that. And, of course, that needs to be followed. But what I want you to understand is that we give ourselves our time and our support our support and the valuing that we give the person we give it unconditionally and we give it freely nobody has to earn it we're there to be we're there to help them no matter what's happening it doesn't matter if they're having a bad day it doesn't matter if you're in a hurry to get something done we accept them exactly where they're at and we try to help with everything they need help with even if that just means listening we're there to accept them. We don't want to necessarily change people. The next core value is compassion. And compassion really means being able to show concern or care for people that have mental, physical, or other types of um, disabilities or other types of, um, what do I want to say, physical problems. And, and, and here's a good example. So let's, let's talk about Joe again. So Joe has arthritis in his hands, and you know this. And usually Joe takes his own, he, he fills out his bank statement and he goes to the bank with you and he goes in and he does his own banking. So he tells you today that he really needs to get some money out of the bank. He wants to know if you can take him and he wants to know also if you can fill his bank slip out because he just can't do it today. And you're like, well, Joe, you always fill your bank slips out. You, you can do it. I don't need to do it for you. Well, show some compassion and understand that maybe Joe can't do it because his, his hands hurt. He has arthritis in his hands and he just 
he can't do it. He cannot, his, his fingers and hands will not work to do that. So he's asking you to do it. Or maybe he can't focus. He says, I really need to get this bank slip filled out, but for some reason I just can't focus today. Well, perhaps it's because Joe, you know that Joe has schizophrenia and at times he hears voices. So maybe if this is a time when he's hearing voices and that won't allow him to write his name and fill out his own bank slip. Be compassionate. Understand if they're asking us for help, there's a reason. And then the last core value is teamwork. And when we talk about teamwork, we don't just mean you and your coworkers. We mean you, your coworkers, the people you work with, the CMH people, the executive director, director of operations, anybody associated with alternative service services that's going to be helpful or implemental in a service for a consumer. So, of course, it's it's really important that you get along with the people that you work with. It's important that you try to show the people in the home what a good team can be. Um, if they if they don't feel that you're working as a team, they could feel discontent and nobody should have to feel discontent in their own home. I've often heard staff say, well, I don't have to get along with the people that I work with. I go in and I do my job and everything's done and the, and the person that I'm working with that day the client they're taken care of yeah but yeah but yeah but of course you may be taking care of them but you don't think that they know that you and the other person don't seem very friendly towards each other or maybe you don't speak at all during the shift you don't think that they know that nobody nobody wants to feel that haven't you ever had people over at your house and maybe two people weren't getting along and it was so uncomfortable you just wanted to like say bye bye well, it would be good if they could always say that, if that's what they were feeling. But we know that in reality, that's not always going to happen. We need people to work there. So even though you don't have to necessarily like the people that you're working with, the staff, you do really have to put effort into it and get along with people and fake it till you make it. If you don't feel like smiling because you're working with somebody else, smile anyways. So that wraps up the mission and the core values of Alternative Services Incorporated. You will be playing many different roles during the course of your shift. What is a role? A role is a part that you will play in a person's life. And you will know what role you will be playing depending on what the person needs in that moment. Not what that person needed yesterday, not what the person needed two hours ago, and not what they may need in an hour. It's moment to moment. So at this moment, they might need you to be a cook because they're hungry and they want to help cook dinner and they want you to help them with that. Then maybe you're going to be a personal bather. You're going to give them a bath later. Maybe in between that time, somebody gets sad because they talked to their mom on the phone and their mom's dog died. Now you're going to be in a supporter and you're going to be a counselor. So you will be playing very, very different roles throughout the whole day. And we need to be flexible. Flexibility is defined as the ability to bend, twist, and be limber. And that is your role as a direct support professional. And then the philosophy of care is a framework of goals and values to help ASI make the best choices for people we serve. One of our jobs as a direct support professional is going to be someone who is flexible. Flexibility means the ability to bend, twist, and be limber. And this does describe your role as a direct support professional. You are going to be whatever role the person needs you to be in that moment. Not what they needed yesterday, not what they needed five minutes ago or what they're going to need in five minutes, but what do they need in this moment? You are a teacher. So from the moment that you walk into that door until the moment you leave, you're a teacher because you're the biggest role model that they may have. Staff may be the only people that they have to teach them what's appropriate, not appropriate. How you react to conflict, how you react to anger or disappointment. If you are a person who maybe you're a hothead and if you're not getting along with one of your coworkers, you start to yell well, now you're teaching the people that live in the home 
that the way that you solve conflict is by yelling. So you always have to remember that whatever you do, you're teaching them to do. You'll also be a teacher of household skills. ASI is committed to helping people be involved in their own lives. So although we don't want you to do everything for them, we want you to teach them and have them involved in everything that, they, that you do for them and with them. You're gonna teach daily living skills, independent living skills. You're gonna be unconditional in every role that you play. You're gonna be an unconditional supporter. You're gonna be an unconditional encourager. You're gonna be an advocate. So let's say that somebody doesn't have a voice and they have a they get headaches often and their standing med order calls for acetaminophen 325 milligrams one to two tabs every four to six hours prn and you know that every time you give this it doesn't seem to help the headache so be the advocate be their voice and speak up and say hey this is not touching this person's pain. What can we get differently to help them? Sometimes the doctors don't want to make changes and it's up to us to make sure that we're documenting every time we give it and it doesn't work. And then every time the doctor says no, but ultimately if the doctor keeps saying no, get a different doctor. And then you're going to be a cheerleader and a coach. You're going to cheer them on. To, to let them know that you believe that they can do things. And then you're gonna be a coach to give them instructions and guide them on how to go about doing it. So after playing your roles or while you're playing your many different roles, you wanna think about your presence. You want your presence to be always to be safe and inviting. So if you look at this picture, the lady that's wearing the hat, she appears very happy. She is smiling and she's got her hands reaching out for the other person. And the other person seems to be the caregiver. She's smiling at her at the same time. So I would interpret this picture and I would interpret the way the person feels as feeling safe and the caregiver is inviting. ASI's philosophy of care policy. ASI will ensure and protect all residents' rights to privacy, dignity, respect, and freedom. Residents have the right to receive personal care in a private area of the home. So if you have to give someone a shower or you have to dress someone, make sure they're in the bathroom with the door closed or in their bedroom with the door closed. And even if they have a roommate, try to Try to only have the person that's being dressed or cared for in the room at that time. Everybody has the right to privacy. They should also be able to visit in a private area and talk on the phone in a private area. And then we always want to make sure that we maintain confidentiality at all times. Every person has the right to privacy. So remember, if you're out in public and you might be joyfully wanting to share a story about client A at this home. Um, don't, don't assume that nobody around there knows who you're talking about. And even if they did, you still aren't allowed to share that. The only way that we need to share information is on a need to know basis. So let's say that you work at home, num home letter A most of the time, but home B is experiencing a severe staffing shortage. So you're going to go over to home B and help them out for a while. But when you get there, just because you work for alternative services at a different home, that does not mean that the people that are working in, in home B has the right to know what's happening with the people that work in home A. Just like when you go back to home A, the home where you usually work, that doesn't mean that you have the right to share all of home B's information with home A. So just remember, if you're in doubt, don't say a word. Privacy is, is crucial. We have to make sure that we uphold our core, mission, our core values in our mission statement by maintaining privacy. SI residents will be provided documentation explaining the process of discharge and evicting before a 30-day notice. So this has to do with dignity and respect. 
They will be provided information about how to submit a complaint anonymously, and they will be shown how to make requests regarding living arrangements. So another aspect of dignity and respect are things like, how are you speaking with that person? Are you talking to that person in a derogatory manner? Or are you talking to that person in a manner that shows dignity? And are you respecting them? Um, we have to make sure that we talk to people with people the way that we want to be talked to and spoken with. If you, again, we have to think about what is perception. So if you are saying something and you don't mean it to sound mean or you don't think it's being disrespectful, if that person or even another staff finds it disrespectful, then you have to think about what the perspective is and change it because you don't want to be seen, even if you don't think it's something that's disrespectful and without dignity, doesn't mean that somebody else won't feel that. So get to know your consumer again and get to know what's considered treating them in a dignified manner versus what you wouldn't do, such as treating them in an undignified manner. So one of the ways that we can show dignity and respect is by the words that we use. No matter what's happening in the moment, our words should always be kind and uplifting. So stop and think about the words that you're saying. Everyone likes to hear positive words and positive phrases. So positive words like, great, happy, joyful, pleasurable, thoughtful, and then words and phrases like, good job, I knew you could do it, you're the bomb, you go guy, keep it going. So anything that you know that is positive and what that person sees as positive are words that you want to, you always want to use because you want them to see you giving them praise for things they do and not giving them nothing for what they don't do. Residents will also have freedom of movement. The first freedom we'll talk about is freedom within the home. So what that means is there will be no gates or locked doors blocking entrances or exits to the home. The home should be physically accessible to all residents. So let's say when Joe came to live in the home 10 years ago, he could walk. Well, now he's had some physical problems and now Joe can't walk and he's in a wheelchair. So now we're going to have to have a ramp built so that Joe can get in and out of his home with accessibility. They should have access to the laundry room, the bathrooms, and kitchens at all times. The kitchen does not close at a certain time. The bathrooms are not shut. The laundry is not restricted from doing it at night. There's no restrictions on any of that. They may eat wherever they want unless it poses a safety risk. So let's say if somebody has a problem listening to everybody chew their food and it's really getting on their last nerve and that person says, I want to get up and go eat in the living room and watch TV, that should be fine. There's no reason they can't do it. It's their home and they should be able to eat where they're the most comfortable. And then there should be no restrictions ever unless it's stated in the plan of service for safety reasons. So let's say Joe's always gone into the kitchen to help you cook. But the last couple times he's been in there, he's had this desire, it seems, to put his hand over the top on top of the burner. And now you're fearful that he's going to burn himself. So you're going to get Joe out of the kitchen. You're going to document. You're going to let the team coordinator know so that the team coordinator know the co team coordinator can let the let the case manager know to do a addendum, an addendum to the plan of service that will say keep Joe out of the kitchen immediately because of safety issues. Um, and if that something like that does happen, then we should be asking to keep people out because we want to keep them safe. The second type of freedom is freedom within the community. ASI is committed to support residents in participating in the community. Residents will be offered opportunities to participate in legal and religious activities, and residents will be offered transportation. Our third freedom is freedom of life choices. ASI will support residents in making decisions about their life, 
controlling their schedule and how they choose to spend their day. We want to always ensure that whatever we do, we try to set people up to succeed. So if we know that Joe is not a morning person, Joe doesn't go to workshop, he doesn't go to work, and he can sleep as long as he wants during the day. He doesn't have to get up for anything. And you know that he's an afternoon person and not a morning person. But you decide that you want to try to get Joe up this morning to start his laundry early. And Joe's like, eh, eh, not happening. I'm not getting up and I'm not doing my laundry. So now it seems like Joe's just being, you know, non-compliant, right? Well, no, he's not being non-compliant. He's just saying, I don't want to get up right now to do my laundry. I know I'm an, a second shift person. I'm a one o'clock person, says Joe. So they can just get me up and I can do my laundry at one o'clock. Or better yet, I'll set my alarm and I'll get up at one o'clock. Or even better than that, I'll just wake up when I want and then I'll do my laundry. There's so many ways that they have not been offered big life choices, the life choices that you and I have had throughout our lives, that it's even more important that we try to find creative opportunities to find ways for them to have life choices, asking them what time they want to do this, what time do they want to do that. Hey, Joe, we need to make a doctor's appointment for tomorrow. What time do you think would be good? Um, you know, it's not about making your job easier. It's about making their life better. And their life is better if they can operate on their own time frame, not your time frame. We all want that, don't we? I think we do. The principle of normalization is the idea that people with disabilities have the right to live a life as typical as possible. It sounds pretty easy, right? Like, of course they do. Well, I mean, why wouldn't they? They're people. Well, for a long time, when institutions were first formed and up until the time they closed, there was really no principle of normalization. Many times they had to, they, people lived in an institution where there was 5,000 other people and there was no normalization. Sometimes there was only one worker for 40 people. So because that experience has not existed for very long, we want to really ensure that we, we try to educate people on what the principle of normalization is and we follow through as a corporation. We do want people to live a life as typical as possible. And what's a typical life? Well, it is different for everybody. So because we believe in person-centered, the principle of normalization for each person will be person-centered. So it looks like the people in the top photo, they are, the, the guy in the wheelchair is just cracking up. Maybe that's his caregiver behind him. He's out in the community having a good time with a friend. And then the young man below, he's working in the greenhouse. Maybe it's a communal greenhouse. Um, but for him, that represents a life as typical to possible. So that is a principle of normalization, just doing every, everyday things that make the person's life worthwhile. The building on the left is Pontiac State Hospital in Pontiac, Michigan. If you look at this building and just looking at this photo, you can't see the rest of it because it is, goes way, way beyond what you see. It's much deeper. And... That's where people used to live. Anybody that had a d developmental disability, people they didn't know what to do with, society's um, vagrant, or just anybody that there was no place for would get put into a state home like this. Now, if you look at the home on the right, it's much smaller. This is actually one of our group homes. This is the Lippincott home in Lapeer, Michigan. But if you can see, it's very much smaller. There's even a garage. There's bushes out in front. And only six people live in this home. It's a six-bed facility. It's not, it's called a facility, but we know that it's really their home. Versus the photo on the left that's a 5,000-person facility. So just the appearance in the living arrangements are much more typical bottom right hand corner most people live in homes that are more looking like this than 
the, the home or the institution in the top left hand corner. So the Pontiac State Hospital, the image that was in the top right left hand corner, I'm sorry, is an example of institutionalization. Institutionalization occurs when people live in places other than their own homes and come to depend on others to take care of them. They become unable to take care of themselves or understand how to get their needs met in a positive way. And then here's some examples of institutionalization. Somebody may be living with 5,000 other people. The, the caregivers or the direct support professionals, they are firm and authoritative. The facility is run more like a medical hospital. There's no community integration. Everything that needs to be done is done in that hospital. There's communal shower rooms, so people don't get to take showers by themselves or baths by themselves at a water temperature they enjoy. They have to share showers with 20 other people at a time or maybe even more. Choices are not offered and you have to share a bedroom with 100 other people. Now part of this is because the, the budgets kept getting cut for institutionalizations for state homes and they kept getting cut back and cut back and cut back where at times there was one worker for 50 people. Now, and Pontiac wasn't the only state home there was in Michigan. There was other state homes. There was Lapeer. Lapeer had one. There was one in um, uh, Traverse City. And I mean, imagine if each of those sites had 5,000 people, there was a lot of people. So when deinstitutionalization occurs, which is our next slide, we had to find homes for people that lived in the institutions. The institutions are closing down. Now where are people going to live? Deinstitutionalization means this. People formerly housed in large institutions away from public view were returned to their communities where they could live cooperatively, grow, and achieve independence and to live a life as typical as possible, such as the principle of normalization defined. So now there's examples where you're living with five other people versus 5,000. You have valuing and supportive DSPs. You have a home-like design and a family type environment. Communal community integration is encouraged and supported. Residents are showered or bathed individually at the water temperature that they enjoy. Choices are offered and supported, and bedrooms are for one to two people. That's a huge difference in institutional living. Alternative Services Incorporated started in 1978 due to a need for homes for people that were getting released from the institution and put into the community residential settings. ASI was one of the front runners to begin providing residential services for the people. And so currently, ASI operates 36 bed licensed group homes licensed by the state of Michigan. It also serves people who live in over 30 unlicensed homes. So this may be one or two people that live in their own apartment and they ASI provides staff, but they don't meet licensing. They don't require licensing standards, but we have high standards, so we still uphold those standards, whether it's licensed or not. And ASI services are contracted through a respective local entity. So it's a CMH in that county. Um, so like Genesee County is Genesis Health System. Lapeer County is Lapeer Community Mental Health. And it's all under the authority of MDHHS, which is Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Currently, ASI provides services in 10 counties. We have 250 people we serve, and we have anywhere from 350 to 400 staff. We have been a well-established corporation. We are highly respected in the community. And again, I would like to welcome you to ASI, and I'd like to thank you for joining our team. Have a groovy day, and you may now take your test. Good luck.
Thank you so much for attending Alternative Services Incorporated's Introduction to Residential Training.